Hi, everyone, and welcome to the Circular City Virtual Showcase. Thank you so much for joining us this afternoon. Um, I'm Kate Schubick, and I'm part of the New Lab team. Um, many of you might be familiar with our work at New Lab, but for those of you who are not, New Lab is a community of experts and innovators applying transformative technology to solve the world's biggest challenges. Through our membership and studios, we bring together entrepreneurs, engineers, inventors, and industry leaders to create sustainable solutions and enterprises. And we employ technologies, including robotics, AI, and material science to transform the things that matter most, like our health, the environment, and our city. Today, you will hear from the Circular City Startup Cohort, who will share their products and technologies and provide an inside look at the data and insights that were generated from their pilots conducted across New York City this year. Then Shana Horowitz, Vice President of Products and Programs at New Lab, will moderate a discussion with the startups on the value of working with civic stakeholders to pilot their products and services and to generate data that benefits New Yorkers. Our startup presenters include Robert Gaffar, Head of North America at El Gramo, Davida Herzl, co-founder and CEO, and Melissa London, chief scientist, both of ACLMA, and David Solomon, chief revenue officer at Sapient Industries. So just a couple of quick housekeeping notes before we get started. We will be taking some questions from the audience throughout the presentation. So to ask a question, please type it out in the Q&A button, and I will help to pose one to two of those questions after each presentation. And then if there's some time at the end of the discussion, we'll also weave in some more audience questions. Um, so with that, I'm going to pass it over to Shana to get us started. Hi, everyone. Thanks, Kate. Um, thank you all for, for being here. Uh, I'm super excited to share the work of our Circular City Studio with all of you today. New Labs Studio programs are really about bringing together problem owners and visionaries with entrepreneurs in order to identify problems, iterate and pilot solutions, and de-risk concepts for, for future investment and scalability. And we launched the Circular City Studio specifically back in 2018 with our partners at the New York City Economic Development Corporation. And really the program has been, you know, since day one about this intention to provide a framework for entrepreneurs to collaborate with civic stakeholders to tackle what is becoming an increasingly complex set of city scale challenges. And we recognized when we started this program that particularly in the realm of, of urban tech, for entrepreneurs and for new companies to address real needs and launch successfully into new markets, the right pilots, proof points, and really the access to city stakeholders is essential. And that's really what this studio is, is about, is providing that set of resources to our teams. So I am, um, you know, thrilled the world has changed a lot since we first launched this program in 2018. Uh, we established it at a time when there was certainly a lot of conversation around what a smart city could be and the role of data in delivering on this, this so-called smart future. And we really intentionally wanted to deflate some of that hype and take a really human-centered and human-scale approach to testing how data and emerging technologies more broadly could support a more sustainable and equitable future for New York City. And I'm really proud of the companies that you're gonna be meeting today because really each of them is, is applying emerging technology to support the city's sustainability agenda in really unique ways. And they're producing data that helps to bring visibility to key sustainability issues and just things that are really top of mind for New Yorkers, thinking about air quality, our transition to a circular economy and our, our efforts to reduce waste and the energy efficiency of our built environment, which uh, is one of the, the greatest drivers for our greenhouse gas emissions here in New York City. So I'm going to hand it over to Robert Gaffar, affectionately known as Bobby, uh, to our team uh, from El Gramo. He's going to kick us off and I look forward to popping up a bit later this afternoon to uh, lead a discussion with all of our teams. So Bobby, I'll hand it over to you. Great, thank you. Um, so excited to share our grandma with everybody. Um, so I'm the head of North America for our grandma. 
and we are gonna just jump right into it. So you go to the next slide. So grandma uh, focuses on three main pillars. Um, the first one being the poverty tax. Um, so the poverty tax is something that affects low income people, specifically around uh, buying single use packaged products. They end up paying uh, upwards of 40% uh, more compared to middle income to higher income uh, customers. And the reason for that is most of the time, low income customers are buying their products at bodegas that don't necessarily have the package uh, purchasing power um, compared to like a Target or a Walmart. Um, the second point is uh, around packaging waste. Clearly, single use packaging is, is polluting our oceans and our waste streams as well. And the third port point is around the future of retail. Um, as COVID has, showed, uh, has shown us is that uh, people are searching for new ways to shop. Um, specifically around savings as well. And, uh, and within that industry, um, there are uh, plenty of challenges around regulatory issues and hurdles um, to try to tackle that as well. Go to the next slide. So what is our grandma? So our grandma is a smart dispensing system that allows consumers to buy the product and not the packaging. So you pay for the liquid and not the actual bottle. And we do this in the most convenient way at the lowest price point and with zero waste. You can go to the next slide. Thank you. And so in terms of the user journey, how do you use it? So it's actually very simple. So you download our app and you add some funds to it. It can be as little as two or three dollars just to get started. And at each location with, with a machine, we have bottles there. So these bottles are actually standard bottles that you would purchase at the store. Um, so like, let's say for instance, a Clorox uh, bleach bottle and located on each bottle is our smart tag. So the smart tag is actually an RFID tag. And what that RFID tag allows us to do is actually associate that bottle to your account. So specifically your email address. So once you sign up and create a grandma account, we know that that's your bottle. When you insert that bottle into, into our machine, it says, hi, hi Bobby, um, you have $3 on your account. How much liquid do you want to dispense um, into your bottle? And so in essence, you're using the packaging as your wallet. And what is, what's great about the machine is, is that you don't necessarily have to pay for that full bottle or that 40 ounces of bleach. If you want to buy it by the ounce, you can buy it by the ounce. And so a little bit later in the presentation, I'll get into um, one of our pilot locations around the laundromat where people actually want to purchase um, only enough for one or two loads and where that feature really comes into play nicely. Um, the next slide is actually going to showcase a very short one minute video. Um, on the on the, the stationary machine uh, um, as well as our tricycle unit um, that we have in Chile. And so uh, the company actually started in Chile and it was uh, started in bodegas actually selling uh, rice and uh, beans in reusable containers and eventually graduated uh, towards selling laundry detergent. And so they got this novel idea to actually put these vending machines on the back of electric tricycles. And so they would drive around uh, Santiago, Chile and do home delivery for detergent and also set up, set up shop in like parks and street corners and so forth. And it's really grown from there. Um, so we have brought it to the States. Uh, we have these stationary units, as you can see there. And the entire process of purchasing your product and setting up your account, as you can see, is very simple. You just, you saw the app prior before, there's Danielle from our team, um, simply dispensing the product and, and there it goes from the bottle. And so um, additionally, um, we just recently partnered with uh, Nestle to start selling dog food uh, with Purina, which has been a big hit in, in Chile as well. So in terms of the system that, um, um, that we're trying to focus on specifically around with brands and retailers and consumers. It may seem like a simple uh, system. However, it's very complex. So specifically with the brands, um, this is giving them a new opportunity to actually sell direct to consumer. So with these, with these brands, let's say uh, Clorox, for example, they sell a lot of their products uh, to wholesale. And so once they sell it to wholesale, they, they uh, lose complete touch in terms of how much their bottles are actually being sold for within big box stores. Um, if you ask them this, they, they actually um, don't know most of the time. It actually fluctuates pretty significantly. Um, additionally, it gives them great insights with using our system um, to actually discover who their customers are, specifically within each location. Um, the second point being around retailers, let's say a big box store, for example, um, 
we envision our machines being in areas that are dead space. So let's say for, in, for instance, the entrance or by the right after the cashier's uh, location, we can take um, the amount of product, let's say bleach, for example, off your shelves so that takes up a significant amount of space and shrink down that size for the same amount of product and liquid and put that, put that into one of our machines into a dead space that wasn't generating revenue before. So retailers, uh, we're talking to um, uh, several uh, different big box retailers. We're just starting to pilot with one in Chile as well. Um, so they see, um, you know, real value in that as well. And so from consumers, it's, it's very clear, right? So there's a savings and convenience point here. So with Bleach, for example, um, as we jump into the, you can jump into the next slide. Um, we are selling uh, Clorox Flushless Bleach um, in several locations right now. So we partnered with the Clorox company, so Clorox Flushless Bleach and Pine Saw. Um, and so for example, at a laundry mat in Bed-Stuy where, where we are currently piloting, customers would pay $5 across the street at a bodega. We currently sell that same bottle for $2. And the reason for that is because the packaging, the bottle itself is 40% of the cost. And, and so that holds true for pretty much any single use packaging product that you buy from detergent to shampoos and so forth. So once consumers realize that significant savings, the light bulb goes off um, that, wow, I just have to bring back this bottle uh, to achieve those savings for products that I, that I love and, and know as well. Um, additionally, we partnered with Colgate uh, to start selling soft soap hand soap, uh, which we'll be rolling out over the next several weeks, as well as, as, well as Ecologic Solutions that's located in, in the Navy Yard that's an eco-friendly uh, cleaning care company. Um, uh, uh, number two and number three locations, we're in Building 77 right now, and just recently uh, rolled out with an Essex market, which is in the Lower East Side. You go to the next slide. And so these are our two machines. The first machine on the, on the left is our first version of the machine that we're gonna be sunsetting soon. Um, that particular machine holds two uh, 55 gallon drums. So it's pretty, pretty significant capacity. The second machine on the right is our new flex unit, which is a reduced capacity around 30 gallons. Um, so that will be selling soft soap, hand soap. And so kind of during, during this pilot, we're really gonna be trying to figure out what is our rate of, what is our rate of sale? What is our capacity? Uh, you know, what's the right level of capacity in terms of the inside of the machine and, and in terms of what locations and segments and customers and so forth. Um, so you can go to the next slide. And so what was extremely interesting is um, during our pilot, we started at the end of August, um, the summer. So I, and I basically lived within a laundromat um, in Bedside, Brooklyn. It was a great experience, learned, learned a ton there. What we realized is that people are actually reusing their packaging. So uh, urban environment, people are carrying their heavy bags of laundry to the laundromat. They don't wanna carry a, a big bottle of detergent. So as, as you can see in the photo, we saw this time after time where people are actually reusing their water bottles to put fabric softener or laundry detergent in. And so um, those particular bottles are clearly uh, not smart bottles like our grandma bottles and people are, aren't being incentivized to do that. They're just naturally doing this. And so with our grandma solution, we want to incentivize them and reward them for using our platform to actually use the existing brand bottles, uh, whether it's incentivized with discounts or access uh, to products in convenient locations or uh, kind of gaming loyalty rewards to run their account too. Uh, but it was, it was uh, a very cool insight to actually see this in person. You go to the next slide. And so in terms of benchmarking, um, how do we define success in the, in the past three and a half months during this pilot? So, um, so for us, it's really kind of drilling down to a unit economics level. So with some of the brands that we're selling, um, you would think that looking at a big box uh, store uh, for those particular brands, that this big, this big box store is kind of kicking our butts in terms of the amount of bottles that they're selling per week. However, if you could go to the next slide, when you actually drill down based on the amount of foot traffic for these stores, so for, for example, a big box store is roughly about 3,000 people a week uh, that come into the store. With, the, with one of our locations, we're, we're having roughly 250 people. So let's say the laundromat, we are selling 2X the amount of bottles compared to that big box store. So for every bottle that we're selling, 100 people walk into that location compared to the big box store. And it's even a, a greater divide uh, with the second brand as well. 
small sample size uh, for our pilot, but in terms of trying to figure out, okay, or you know, are the amount of bottles that we're we're selling per week is that good or is that bad? It's actually pretty good early on. Um, so it's very it's encouraging to see that. We could go to the next slide. Um, so during the pilot, uh, we conducted over 300 uh, in-person surveys. Um, and what we learned is that uh, the key selling point that people really latched onto was the savings part, so over 63%. And so the three, the three seconds that you actually have to pitch the machine to people, um, price was really the sticking point. So as I mentioned earlier with the Clorox bottle, $5 versus $2, the light bulb goes off immediately. And then people start to ask a lot of questions um, around the machine and how it works. The second point being detergent is a big request for obvious reasons. And we're working that, working on that uh, for Q1. And then the third point, which is very encouraging as well, is that people, uh, a majority of people have said they will re reuse their bottle and bring it back. So you could go to the next slide. And so in terms of uh, how we look uh, for the vision of our platform, we see this as kind of a full omni-channel experience. Um, so in terms of mobile, you show the tricycle in the video, uh, we believe there's an opportunity for at-home delivery in farmer's markets. We actually have the tricycle sitting uh, in the loading dock area at, uh, at New Lab. Uh, New York DMVs has been kind to us to try to figure out how to register, register this, um, but we'll get this sorted out. Hopefully uh, you'll see a driver around the Brooklyn Navy Yard soon. Um, second point being around stationary uh, machine is, is uh, we see great opportunity around residential buildings uh, located in the city. Um, just imagine kind of going down to your lobby or your laundromat and uh, refilling your laundry detergent bottle late at night. Um, especially now, you don't want to necessarily go out to, out to the bodega or CVS and so forth to go do that. Um, college campuses, we think are a great opportunity. Laundromats, transfer, transportation hubs. And then with retails, we mentioned we're speaking to several big box retailers. And we think there's an opportunity to eventually go away from the stationary unit with two uh, dispensers on it for products and building a full kind of wall with like eight or 10 or 12 different types of products to have a kind of a full immersive uh, retail experience to refill your bottles. So you could go to the next slide. And then so briefly, so as I mentioned, um, our, our grandma was actually started in Chile roughly about eight years ago. And it was started uh, with providing lower income uh, uh, people uh, with opportunity to purchase rice and beans at a lower dollar amount uh, by reusing the plastic containers. So they actually had 80% retention rate uh, with the machines and reusing their containers and eventually graduated toward this, this cool electric tricycle um, with the 40% re reuse rate with laundry detergents, which is just still a terrific number. Um, and so with our investors and awards, uh, which we're very proud of as well, um, and as I mentioned earlier, uh, we just rolled out a pilot uh, with Nestle with uh, Purina dog food as well. Um, and the next slide I think is it, yes. Uh, so thank you. So obviously just wanna thank the New Lab team uh, for allowing us to participate in the studio. It's been great, uh, just getting great insight and great feedback from the team. And thank you everybody else uh, for watching the presentation. Okay, great. Thank you so much, Bobby. Um, so I, we've got a lot of great questions from the audience. I appreciate everybody uh, uh, sending these in, and we'll certainly cover a few of these in the moderated discussion. But um, Bobby, I wanted to pose one to you now before we move sure. on. A couple of people were asking about, is there a limit to the reusability of the bottles? Um, and also what happens to them kind of after they've reached their, the end of their life? Sure. Um, so we do have an internal like internal uh, guesstimate or assumption, I would say, like roughly about 12 reuses for the bottle. In actuality, I mean, these, this, these plastic bottles last forever, right? As we see, they're kind of dumped into the ocean or dumped into the general waste stream. Um, this is kind of just part of the, the, the test over the next couple of months to see how long the, the these bottles actually last. I think what will end up happening is that the labels and the, um, the stickers might get a bit damaged from just liquid, and then people might just want to, um, you know, substitute that out for a new bottle. Um, what happens with the new bottles themselves? It's a plastic bottle. Um, so if you're going to change it out after a few uh, reuses, just please put it into rec your recycle bin. Great. Thank you so much. Uh, okay, so now we are going to segue into our next presentation. Um, so I'm going to invite the ACLMA team. Uh, we will first hear from Davida Herzl, co-founder and CEO, and then she will be joined by her colleague, Melissa Linden, chief scientist at ACLMA. Davida, I'll hand it over to you. Great. Well, thank you so much. And thank you to New Lab for inviting us to participate in the Circular City Studio program and the showcase today. I'm Davida Herzl, and I'm co-founder and CEO of ACLMA. 
I'll start by giving everybody a quick overview of our company and our technology. Um, and then I'll be joined by uh, our chief scientist, Dr. Melissa London, who will share some of the preliminary insights from our ongoing analysis of all of the block by block air quality and greenhouse gas data that we generated during our campaign across downtown Brooklyn and nearby communities between August 5th and November 4th. 2020 has really put um, air pollution at the forefront of our collective attention. The same emissions that are changing our climate are also making the air we breathe unhealthy, causing disease, and we now know even increasing COVID-19 death rates. This is causing trillions of dollars in health costs for local and uh, for local economies, the global economy. And, uh, and, and critically, uh, because of historical racial injustices, these impacts affect communities of color disproportionately. For example, Black Americans are three times more likely to die from exposure to air pollution. And it's clear that we now have to take very bold climate action centered in equity. And to really transform the way that we manage air pollution and greenhouse gas emissions, we need to improve the way that we measure it and understand it not just at the global level, but really at the local level where action happens. Aclima has really been built uh, to serve this need. We are a public benefit corporation, a pioneer in what we call hyperlocal air pollution and greenhouse gas measurement and analysis. We founded Aclima more than a decade ago um, to solve this really difficult technology problem and science problem to fill a critical gap in hyperlocal environmental data to enable people to understand two critical things where pollution is coming from and who it's affecting. The platform is a one stop shop that enables no friction access to air pollution and greenhouse gas data at this unprecedented scale and very powerful analytics to help make sense of that data and apply it. Our customers, governments, and businesses, as well as communities, use our data and our analytics to target interventions to reduce emissions, protect public health, and benchmark progress over time. Historically, just to give you sort of a, a sense for how uh, uh, significant the improvements in our technology are relative to traditional approaches, um, historically, air pollution has been measured by very large and very expensive equipment that is extremely difficult to deploy. And that results in very sparse measurement that gives us a general picture of air pollution and helps us understand what's happening at the regional scale. But what we're really missing with this infrastructure is a deeper and bigger story. It doesn't tell us what's happening at the neighborhood scale, at the local scale, to help us understand where that pollution is coming from and who it's affecting. In order to fill the gaps, we've pioneered an entirely new way to measure air pollution and greenhouse gases block by block. Today, our fleet of sensor-enabled vehicles, along with our partner fleets, make up the, makes up the world's largest uh, mobile environmental sensor network. Our network and our platform are designed to measure air quality and greenhouse gases at scale and block by block. The platform samples air through a specialized intake, geotags the air sample, sends it to our internet connected sensors that sit in that vehicle. Um, that vehicle is routed through city streets, generates those block by block measurements that then are sent up to the cloud and, and to our analytics engine to really visualize and analyze that data. A really critical part of our network are the people that power it. Um, we recruit mobile sensor operators from the communities we serve, creating full-time jobs with benefits and paths to upskilling. So this is really intended to extend the benefits of our work to communities and to really power local job creation. One very powerful example of our work with communities is actually in West Oakland in California, where our data has been used to inform the development of a community emissions reductions plan, one of the first of its kind, called Owning Our Air. It is the most comprehensive community-led plan in California, um, and our data helped to inform uh, nearly 100 um, emissions reductions and intervention strategies that are now getting implemented and benchmarked. And so now that you have some background on ACLMA and how we're, we measure hyperlocal air pollution and, and, uh, and how it gets utilized, um, let's talk about what we're doing in, in, in Brooklyn. For this pilot, um, in collaboration with New Lab and the Downtown Brooklyn Partnership, we measured block by block air quality in downtown Brooklyn, Gowanus, Sunset Park, and nearby communities between August 5th and November 4th. We gathered more than 125 million data points covering about 400,000 people. We measured nine pollutants seven days a week, day and night. Um, uh, we have three team members based in Brooklyn and more than 100 of us at, at the company are working to support this initiative from operating the fleet, verifying the data and generating scientific insights for that, from that data um, for, uh, for the community. 
Uh, and so to talk about those insights, um, I'll hand it over to our chief scientist, Dr. Melissa London, who will share some of those initial insights from our measurements in Brooklyn. Uh, thank you, Davida. And thank you, New Lab, for inviting me to share some of our preliminary observations on our hyperloader air quality data in Brooklyn. What you see here are maps of block by block pollutant levels averaged over three months. These are for nitrogen dioxide, fine particulate matter or PM2.5, uh, carbon monoxide and black carbon. On the maps, red indicates comparatively higher levels and green indicates comparatively lower levels of air pollution. Uh, one important insight is that the three month averages of PM2.5, ozone, nitrogen dioxide and carbon monoxide did not exceed EPA national ambient air quality standards. However, on several blocks, PM2.5 levels did exceed the EPA one year standard. Um, in the next slides, we will take a closer look at how averages of these different pollutants compared between areas near downtown Brooklyn, Gowanus Park and Sunset Park starting with downtown Brooklyn. Uh, here we show block by block heat map of the three month average levels of nitrogen dioxide. On average, uh, the, the average level of pollutants in the downtown Brooklyn district were similar or slightly lower than the average over the entire me measured area with the exception of NO2, which was about 5% higher. Uh, next, let's look at the Gowanus district. Uh, these three maps show average black carbon PM2.5 and nitrogen dioxide levels. Higher black carbon levels in this area were likely due to emissions from the BQE, but may also be due to industrial sources in the district. Uh, the area also had higher average NO2 and PM2.5 levels. Another interesting signal to note is that the average NO2 concentrations in the below gate grade sections of the BQE are higher than the above grade sections. Uh, moving south, let's take a look at Sunset Park and how it compared to the entire area. In general, Sunset Park had lower average concentrations of all pollutants, with the exception of carbon monoxide. Uh, most carbon monoxide in urban areas comes from vehicles and outdoor levels are typically far below regulatory thresholds. Thank you, Melissa. Now, th now that we've heard a few of those high level observations about how the different areas compare at a high level, we're gonna take a, deep, a deeper uh, dive into three hotspots um, at the block level. Again, these hotspots are just from 100 of the more than 3000 blocks that we measured. So really we're just scratching the surface of what we can learn from the data, but they really highlight how powerful hyper-local measurement is to really understand what's happening um, at the human scale. Melissa? Thank you, Davida. Uh, the Columbia Waterfront District is a st strong hotspot with NO2 levels 33% higher and black carbon 44% higher than the overall three month average. Interestingly, the levels were higher during non rush hour periods. Uh, this combination of elevated NO2 and black carbon often indicates emissions from diesel sources. So we may be seeing the impacts of truck traffic here. In addition, some pollutants may be the result of emissions coming from the nearby entrance of the Brooklyn Battery, Battery Tunnel. Why this matters? Nitrogen dioxide is formed from fossil fuel combustion and is a key component of smog. It irritates and can damage the respiratory system. Black carbon refers to the black particles emitted from sources that burn fossil fuel, especially diesel. You can see black carbon in the smoke that comes from old heavy duty trucks or buses or some construction equipment. It's often associated or it is associated with health problems, including respiratory, cardiovascular disease and cancer. We see similar hotspots near ports, distribution hubs, and places of goods movement. And there are several interventions that can help mitigate these types of emissions. These include requiring trucks to be turned off when loading and unloading, limiting idling, incentivizing cleaner first mile and last mile freight, and revising truck routes and designated truck parting areas away from residential neighborhoods, schools, and other areas of concern. Thank you, Melissa. Um, so now we're going to take a, a, a deep dive into one school uh, in the measured area. Um, uh, you know, a reminder, there are uh, many schools throughout the area that we measured, but we're going to really zoom in on, on, uh, on the Brooklyn New School and the DiMatina Playground to see how hyperlocal data can help us understand higher pollutant levels near sensitive populations, the people that are most sensitive to exposure to pollution, like children. Melissa? Thank you. Uh, the Brooklyn New School and Dematita Playground are examples of a school in an outdoor recreation area close to a busy traffic on the, on the expressway. Pollutants typically seen from vehicle traffic are elevated in this area, including NO2, black carbon, and carbon monoxide. Three month average NO2 in these blocks is about 40% higher than the overall mapped area, although to reinforce uh, the averages that we measured were below regulatory thresholds. Uh, and weekdays tended to be higher than weekends. This matters because as I mentioned previously, black carbon and nitrogen dioxide have significant negative health packs. 
impacts, uh, health, negative health impacts. Uh, public health experts consider children to be particularly sensitive to air pollution. Also physical exertion such as playing sports can worsen the health effects of air pollution exposure. One approach that can be accomplished quickly to address schools near high sources like this is to install air filters in the schools. Uh, because pollutant levels are higher on weekdays, perhaps shifting to the weekends if there's flexibility in scheduling outdoor athletic activities. Also consider limiting out exertion outdoors, especially for people who are sensitive to air quality, like children, older adults, and people with respiratory conditions. Thank you, Melissa. Um, and now that we've looked uh, at some hyperlocal insights at the Columbia Waterfront District and the Brooklyn New School, let's look at one last example of a hotspot that really shows us how hyperlocal data can help us find needles in haystacks, helping us see things that were unknown or previously invisible to us. Melissa? Along the Gowanus Canal, we observed a couple of PM2.5 hotspots. You can see here in dark red, surrounded by mostly green or yellowish blocks of lower concentrations. This elevated pollution is near a group of sources, an asphalt plant, concrete supply, a scrap metal yard. The PM2.5 near the concrete supply is about 50% higher and it's 150% higher near the asphalt plant. The highest blocks are close to three times the overall average of the entire mapped area. Uh, these areas also had elevated levels of NO2 and black carbon, all of which indicate industrial activity and truck traffic in this area. This matters because PM2.5 is one of the primary pollutants that people are concerned about because it is linked to asthma, lung cancer, and deaths from cardiopulmonary diseases, in addition to a number of other health, uh, health impacts. Uh, this also shows that elevation matters as PM2.5 levels were higher on the elevated expressway and lower at ground level, indicating that emissions are either being released higher up or are blown upwards. Uh, when, you, when you come across areas of high pollution like this, it's important to consider proximity to residential and uh, sensitive receptors, if there are any. Um, also, look at the truck routes to and from these businesses in addition, in addition to sort of industrial uh, sources. Make sure that, that those trucks are not, uh, are not coming close to you know, regions uh, with, with children, with schools, with residential areas. Great. Thank you so much, Melissa. Um, just a reminder, these are just preliminary insights and overview of just a few hotspots from over um, 3,000 blocks that were measured. We've only looked at about 100 uh, in, this, in this analysis that we presented today. And there's just so much to learn from uh, this very rich data. We measured a lot more pollutants, pollutants that aren't regulated um, uh, as well. Um, and so there's a lot to learn here. And so as a next step, um, we are actively engaging local community uh, members, um, uh, uh, agency representatives, environmental justice organizations to inform that analysis of, of the data into 2021. And um, we wanna ensure that the analysis really supports their goals and their efforts to reduce emissions and protect public health. Um, and we're really excited to do that. Um, and so with that, we conclude our presentation uh, today of our, of our work uh, to date in Brooklyn. And we invite everybody to visit acclima.io forward slash Brooklyn to sign up for updates about our scientific analysis and tools that we'll be making publicly available next year. Thank you so much, everybody. Excellent. Thank you so much, Davida and Melissa. That was great. Um, so I want to share one question from the audience. Actually, a few people were curious about this. So the, the collection period for ACOMA for this pilot fell over the months of August to November. Um, and so folks are interested in understanding what your thoughts are on how um, COVID could have impacted the data. Obviously, there was some um, lockdowns in place or so reduction in travel or, or non-essential business during this period. Do you have any thoughts or inclinations on, on how this data may have been impacted given the timing? Sure. So, you know, what's so interesting about this information is um, and about these measurements is that when we look at sort of regional air quality, right, um, you will sometimes, because of shelter in place, depending on the region, you'll see those, you know, reductions. But what hyperlocal data enables you to see is that those reductions aren't evenly distributed because there are different local sources. And so it's not just traffic that changes um, uh, uh, air pollution, it's, it's other local sources that impact pollution. Um, and there's sources that are persistent despite uh, what's happening with um, with uh, with transportation. So um, what's what's powerful is that it really helps us see that true burden um, uh, and not just reductions in one or two sort of sources of emissions. Melissa, is there anything you'd like to add to that? <laughs> no, that was, that was an excellent summary, Davida. Um, it certainly analysis has showed an overall lower uh, uh, concentration of some pollutants, but not all pollutants. Um, 
especially PM2.5, did not significantly decrease as a result of COVID. So as, as Davida said, the, uh, the changes were, uh, were, very, were very localized and very pollutant dependent. Great, thank you so much for that response. Um, excellent, well now we're gonna uh, move on to our, our third and final presentation um, from David Solomon, Chief Revenue Officer at Sapient Industries. Uh, so David, I'll, I'll invite you on and we'll pass it over to you. Fantastic. So yes, I'm David Solomon. I'm the Chief Revenue Officer of uh, Sapient Industries. You know, thanks for joining us today. I'm excited to share our engagement with Circular City and New Lab for this virtual showcase. Uh, I hope you'll find that this review of what we'll call commercial plug load management as an interesting topic. As a quick background, Sapien is headquartered in Philly. We've been around for five years. We work with a large uh, enterprise organizations throughout North America, and we'll soon begin to roll out internationally in 2021. We work within an unlimited number of verticals, such as tech, education, telecom, healthcare, government, to name a few. And we cover applications ranging from dense office space to laboratories to manufacturing, as well as industrial. On the agenda today, we'll review six topics. We'll discuss what is plug load, the building energy consumption problem and trends. We'll talk about what Sapien's bringing as its plug load management system. We'll talk about new lab pilot and the results and scale. And then lastly, we'll talk about our assessment and, um, and, and perhaps we have time COVID-19. So next slide. So what is plug load? Today I'll discuss plug load, which is the electrical power consumed by all plugged in devices and equipment throughout a building and by accessing and analyzing the plug load data. And it is all about the data. It can help better manage commercial building energy consumption. So what is today's commercial building problems? On average, this is an illustration of a commercial building. On average, HVAC and lighting drives two thirds of energy consumed and plug load represents the other one third. And all the new innovation has only focused on HVAC and lighting and those are becoming more efficient and are, they're expected to reduce from their current two thirds to less than 50% of total building energy consumption in a few years. So what does that become a plug load? Well, because plug load is unmanaged, that will take up the void and it's expected to increase from one third to over 50% with almost half of that expected to be wasted energy due to something called vampire draw or phantom load. And that is the situation when a piece of equipment is left on but unused and energy is still being drawn and wasted. And that's what we're trying to solve for. Lastly, the opportunity to have smart buildings with central visibility, with full building information, allows building managers to make more informed decisions. But to do so, they really need the most granular level of data. And that truly really is at the plug load, load uh, data level. So the Sapien solution is a full turnkey in the cloud SaaS software as a service application that runs a deployment of smart outlets and power strips that do two things. They can collect plug load data, analyze that data, and control the power for each plugged in device in a building. And by control, I mean turn things on and off. The web application uses machine learning and AI that provides predictive analytics that leverages what is believed to be the largest repository of plug load data in existence, covering hundreds and hundreds of different pieces of equipment. The, the smart plugs and strips are smart because each one of the sockets can do two things. First, they can wirelessly communicate to the application in the cloud with all the power data from each piece of equipment, including its voltage, current, and reactive power profile. Think of it as the electrical fingerprint of each piece of equipment. And each socket has re relay switch so they can be turned off and on from rules generated in the app. Sapien's value proposition drives three key areas of monetization. The first is reduction of energy consumption by using after hour rules to turn equipment off as well as shifting energy consumption from periods of peak usage to off peak usage and off peak rates. The second is the enhancement of asset management. And we can do three things. The first is using our automated anomaly detection and notification feature via email or text. We can track any device that operates outside of its operating ratings and this drives proactive and predictive preventive maintenance. Two, we can also identify redundant equipment 
And lastly, identify wasted space for improved space optimization. Together, these have reduced total building energy consumption on average between 12 and 20%, with an RO payback between one and three years, depending on how many of these benefits you take advantage of. Lastly, and sometimes most importantly, we can help on the sustainability initiatives by reducing carbon footprint based on the amount of kilowatt hours saved. So let's see how our platform actually works. First, the dashboard is loaded with powerful data analytics to visualize massive amounts of data points streaming from every single electrical socket throughout the building. Here, a user can view the energy consumption for each equipment or an aggregate, as well as the power demand through time. The application provides important insights. For example, it can group by equipment type to understand what is consuming the most energy. For example, let's see all the refrigerators and TVs. And at the bottom, you can view their demand over day. And you can filter by any building region or room for high resolution, high resolution and metering. As I shared before, all the data is driven with advanced analytics using machine learning. This allows for automated labeling for each piece of a plugged in equipment right in the application. The result is over 90% accurate equipment identification. This is especially useful as equipment is often moved. In a matter of seconds, the system can walk a user through the complex logic to manage the process. It can be done by either using the system's bulk accept labeling suggestion feature, or individually you can manually review each suggestion for each device. This example shows the equipment changes on specific rooms and specific floors. Here a small cappuccino machine is replaced by a microwave and another by a monitor. The Sapien app also provides granular automated control. As I stated, a user can control power delivery to each piece of equipment using rules that are the logic used to turn on and off equipment. Here, we're showing rules being created for TVs. The first labels them and then sets the time to have them quote on Monday through Friday between 6 a.m. and 7 p.m. You can also apply the rules to specific equipment. For example, to quickly filter for all TVs at one time, or this allows resulting energy to be saved for this one rule. If you look in the bottom right hand corner, you can see that here it could save 751 kilowatt hours by turning them off after hours. Now that you understand how the Sapien platform works, let's now review the New Lab pilot setup. At New Lab's direction and due to COVID, they wanted to first focus on 20,000 square feet out of their 80,000 full square feet facility focusing on conference rooms, cafes, kitchens, and common space. It included 92 sockets that took only one hour to install and required no research from the new lab staff. From a visual perspective, here are some of the key areas of conference rooms, floating desks, cafes, and refrigerators. After the system was fully installed, we performed a baseline period of one month without setting up any rules. We saw that occupants began working at around 9.30 a.m. with activity peaking from 10 a.m. to 1 p.m. and occupants ending work around 7 p.m. We also gained insights into how the space itself was used. We show the cafe consumed the most energy by several multiples and that the two adjacent conference rooms were disproportionately used. One was used three and a half more times than the other. And this does indeed have implications, especially during COVID-19 in terms of social distancing, cleaning decisions and space utilization. We also gained insights into how specific pieces of equipment are used and whether any of them have any operating issues. If you remember, I spoke about the anomaly alert system we have. Our electrical anomaly detection features verified that here in New Lab, there were actually no anomalies over the course of the pilot. In terms of identifying the equipment consuming the most energy, it was refrigerators followed by power banks and the flex workstations and then TVs. We even noticed that one refrigerator consumed twice as much energy as the other identical one, which usually indicates that the compressor is nearing end of life and should be serviced. 
By using these insights, New Lab implemented rules to turn off equipment when unused. This process requires a balance between, monitor, between um, minimizing occupancy distribution and maximizing energy savings. The New Lab team decided on a regional based rule approach rather than an equipment based rule approach. After these rules ran for about a month, we generate a comprehensive package of reports to determine if any modification should be made. Here we show the report for energy savings. On the left, it shows rules that, that are active and inactive. On the right, the report shows suggested rules that are either non-active or don't exist. These suggested rules are intelli intelligently created by the system. They also include an automated calculation of the estimated impact for each suggested rule. This allows you to decide whether to accept and implement each rule. Based on this data for New Lab, we saw two interesting things. The first was one refrigerator was missed from the cafe rule set because we did it in a regional basis. And the other showed rules for TVs that were left inactive. These rules were accepted and increased the total saving impact at the new lab location by 25%. Let's now turn our attention to the results. During this pilot period, Sapien solution resulted in an overall reduction of plug load by 50% and total energy savings of almost 9,000 kilowatt hours. Additionally, we, focused, we, for, we forecasted the ROI payback for this type of project to be slightly under one year. From a sustainability standpoint, annual carbon reduction is expected to be 1,360 pounds of carbon, which is equivalent to 5,400 pounds of coal not being burned to generate energy. And it has a lot of other similar um, uh, comparisons that you can make. Sapien's involvement with Circular City and New Lab has certainly helped from a networking standpoint. It generated over 15 introductions ranging from property management companies, utilities, to city agencies and other commercial companies. And two of them have led to contracts. So we're very happy about the results of their networking ability. New Lab pilot results from a public dashboard. This was uh, resulted from our working sessions that we have with New Lab and Circular City. It was suggested in terms of education and working with the employees to develop an employee facing dashboard to share the impact um, across the organization. And SAPID has actually deployed this with our clients. For a potential second phase at New Lab, we would look to scale across all of the 80,000 square feet that would include the machine shop, the prototyping lab, the industrial equipment, as well as almost 30 client office spaces and event spaces. With more equipment would come a material increase in energy savings. The broader scale and opportunity that plug load management can bring to New York City includes bringing greater visibility and control access on any size commercial building without disrupting business operations or being affected by occupancy changes, especially during COVID. And we can do this while also scalably complying with building codes, enhancing sustainability initiatives, expanding installation that requires just a few days for every 100,000 square feet of space, and requiring very limited client resources as Sapien provides an account management support throughout the entire system. We are a managed SaaS solution. And we provide a strong ongoing ROI, again with payback anywhere between one and three years. In summary, as plug load continuously increases its slice of total building energy from the current 30% to possibly over 50% in a few years, it can now be managed scalably. Our one match repository of plug load data containing billions of data points continues to grow over thousands of equipment. And we can work with organizations as they get through in the next few years, local law 97, which will have emission uh, requirements that many will have to meet. And that is the presentation. One thing we'd like to add is that we do provide um, opportunity and anybody looking to look at their building, a plug load assessment and uh, in which we'll go in and actually go through all the specific monetization features that I discussed during this presentation, as well as um, looking at the carbon reduction opportunities. Thank you for your time today. Great, thank you so much, David. Um, that was an excellent presentation. I uh, want to share one question from the audience before we segue into our discussion. 
So given that building occupancy has been down over the course of this pandemic, has Sapien um, thought about or pivoted their product at all? Uh, or have you found that the solution as it exists is still relevant even with less people utilizing equipment uh, and, and plug load within buildings? Yeah, great question. And what we've found is that uh, we've actually benefited a lot of our clients who have been using us pre-COVID then during COVID. I'll talk about the first two pieces real quickly. The first addresses this misalignment during COVID in which occupancy levels have sharply declined, but energy consumption has only slightly decreased. Many surveys, and we see firsthand, uh, there was one that was done in New York over millions of square feet. And what it showed was 90, occupancy was down 96%, but energy consumption was only down about 10 to 15%. The reason why there's misalignment, typically people left their buildings in March and April, they didn't unplug any of the devices. They're still running and consuming quite a bit of energy when you think that plug load itself can represent 30 to 50%. And the other side of it is that some of our clients have actually added our solution as another layer of providing safe distancing by deactivating power to adjacent workstations. They use it as part of their, another chapter in their uh, um, return to work playbook. Excellent, thank you so much. Um, all right, well, with that, uh, that concludes our startup presentation. So now I'm going to invite uh, Shana and the rest of our startup presenters back onto the screen for a discussion. Thank you, Kate. Uh, I'll give everyone just a minute to tune back in. Um, thank you all for, for sharing that level of insight with us into to what you've been up to in New York City over this past year. Uh, I actually want to start the discussion uh, kind of riffing off of something that David touched on at the end of his presentation, which was kind of putting into context Sapien Industries uh, product offering in terms of local law 97 and kind of new market momentum that's been created by that. Um, of course, each of the, the pilots that we, we just learned about here today, you know, are pilots. They're, they're meant to kind of signify um, what the type of value that we could hope to see when these, these products are, are scaled to the city level. But I'd love to hear from each team kind of how you place your work within the broader context of some of these policy goals and really some of the, the broader um, you know, conversations that are afoot, whether it's related to reducing, you know, Bobby, in your case, you know, single use pa packaging and, and reducing the amount of waste that gets to landfill Certainly, Aklama, I know for your team, um, thinking through kind of environmental justice movements is, is really important. But um, maybe we can start with you, Bobby, and just talk about you know, how we, you think about El Gramo's impact in the work that you're doing in terms of the, this broader sustainability movement and some of the policy goals related to that. Sure. Um, so I think... Um... The best of uh, analogy or kind of comparison that we could use is is what happened really recently with single use uh, plastic bags and you know uh, passing laws to reuse uh, to have, to use reusable bags within grocery stores and, and other general stores. Um, it would be great if cities and states started passing these laws and you had to reuse your packaging. It'd be great for us, but I think there are similar. Um, uh, parallels in terms of with what we're trying to do overall with um, states and cities um, goals in terms of redu uh, reducing plastic waste and just pollution in general. So, so I think we perfectly align with that. I th additionally, um, I know it's a little bit outside of the question, but we think we also perfectly align with brands too. So a lot of these large CPG uh, brands actually have uh, five to 10 year uh, goals around net zero emissions. And so that's why we have seen a lot of interest from uh, major CPG brands uh, for this particular solution. Um, so, you know, in terms of looking forward with, with municipalities and so forth, we think, you know, the solution that we're presenting is very straightforward. It helps hit those goals. Um, and we look forward to, to potentially partnering and continuing to partner with the city as well on, on accomplishing that. Nice. That's great. Yeah, I also I love um, how El Grama's product, I think, is, is such a great example of making, you know, the sustainable choice, also the affordable and the convenient one, right? A lot of times when it comes down to individual consumer choice, sometimes it feels like to be sustainable it requires more resources in the form of, you know, money or time. And I love that El Grama is really meeting customers where they're at and providing a, a sustainable choice that's easy to, to say yes to in terms right. of price. And, and very quick on that point, I think what we have found is, is that 
people, the light bulb goes off from the price and savings component, and then it's the convenience factor, and then sustainability is third. It's the fact that um, they don't even know that they're necessarily being sustainable. It's right. just it's ne- it's just starting at that savings component and kind of dwindling down. Um, and I think you know uh, personally, I think we have everything that we need to kind of combat the, the challenges around climate change and so forth. We just have to be a bit more creative in terms of how we go about that. So that's why we feel very uh, confident and good about El Gramo going forward. Great, thanks Bobby. Um, Davida or Melissa, anything to add from, from the ACLIMA perspective in terms of how you situate your work in terms of a policy agenda or goals? Yeah, so I mean, you talked about, you know, carbon neutrality goals, right? The, the goal to reach carbon neutrality by, by 2050. Um, and, and resources, right? In order to really understand uh, where to target those resources to reduce emissions, but also get the public health benefits uh, to address equity, um, we really have to understand what the baseline is today at that local level. Um, generally, um, carbon dioxide isn't measured in urban areas. Um, methane levels aren't measured um, in, in, uh, in, at the local scale at this really granular um, view. And so in order to really target you know, uh, those investments, um, it's important to really understand um, uh, where, uh, where the hotspots are and really what is happening at the local level. And so um, the data really helps to understand those problem areas, prioritize uh, environmental justice, track progress, and then really importantly, refine those approaches over time, right? So the value of, of continuous measurement is really important there in, in meeting those goals. And we've been learning a lot from you know, engaging with local stakeholders and thanks to all the work that New Lab's been, been doing us doing to put us in touch with everyone. Absolutely. Um, David, you, you talked a little bit about kind of local law 97, but but what do you what do you hear from your customers? Are they are they thinking about kind of changes that need to be need to be made because you know they're they're feeling that market pressure? Or they're just thinking about their balance sheet and, and wanting to find you know new ways to to recognize savings. Sure, I think the uh, the more progressive clients and the prospects we talk to are thinking ahead. If they have a good strong sustainability team, they certainly are. I think the biggest change that we're seeing at a positive level is the um, adjusting the realignment sometimes between a property owner and tenant. And it's really going to have to be a combined effort in order for the, you know, in, in New York, you know, there's, I think, uh, buildings that with over 25,000 square feet that will be part of uh, local law 97. I think there's over 50, 50, 60,000 buildings, 57,000 buildings across the city that meets that requirement as part of the Green New Deal that they're trying to impact and very progressive. But what we are seeing is different types of conversations where, although a tenant may be responsible for their own utility within the building, using something like plug load management is something they can do. And now we're before uh, a, a building owner may not have the incentives to come in and help their tenants save money, you know, by reducing energy and they would just leave it to them. There's now conversations happening across all tenants and buildings. And it's really nice to see, it's no longer, yeah. not always an adversarial, but sometimes not as a tight role and the landlords are gonna to have to, and the property owners are gonna, managers are gonna to have to work with the tenants in a closer manner. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. One of the things that I was struck struck by in some of our earlier conversations, I'm wondering if you could elaborate on this a little bit, is just, you know, a lot of times people hear, oh, you know, retrofits and when it comes to buildings and energy savings, it sounds like it's gonna take a long time, it's gonna be very invasive and it's gonna be very expensive. And so it's easier, especially if, if the policy hasn't quite caught up to us to, to do nothing until it's, it's, it's you know, we get to a, to a forcing point. Um, but I think, you know, in learning about your product and, and where you sit in the market, the plug load management aspect really offers something that, as you detailed, is, you know, easy to install, very non-invasive, something that, you know, a landlord or even a renter could could. Uh, institute themselves. Do you see education, like an education kind of gap in the market in terms of how people are thinking about mm-hmm. plug load management as part of the overall energy efficiency equation? Yeah, a lot of areas to address there. But um, um, I will say that, you know, whether you have a LEED Platinum certified building, which we've worked with before, and we're the last opportunity of, of helping them reduce energy, they got diminishing returns of what else they can do for that building with the last, you know, third leg, um, or you have a quote, dirty building that doesn't have 
hasn't gone to LED lighting and hasn't gone to retro commissioning HVAC projects, we could be an easy first slice. Plug load management can be the first, easy first slice. You don't need electricians. You don't need integration unless you really want it. And you know we've gotten people up in weeks. Mm -hmm. So the process of going in and doing, as I said, 100, every 100,000 square feet for us on for a dense office building takes you know anywhere between about a day, maybe a day and a half. So we can scale that up where we're doing seven figures of, of uh, square footage of dense office space pretty darn quickly. And then you're up and running. You know, so we could be there for a few days, um, do some base, you know, do testing, doing baselining for two to four weeks, and then it's, it's up and running. It didn't take a concerted effort from their team at all. Mm -hmm. uh, you said it's, it's just a low to, we've developed this solution where we can bring in our folks to help run the application as well. I can say they're not out facility. Managers like to use the, the some are very progressive and others like the, love the technology, but don't want to have to run it or worry about it day to day. So our team will come in and run reports and put help them deploy the rules that they want to do. And we found it as a very low touch um, opportunity for them. And with the ROI, getting something between two and three years, worst case is something that seems to uh, resonate well with them. Great. Uh, okay, next I want to transition. Uh, a big part of the Circular City Studio has been you know, building the right kind of advisor network for, for your teams. And each of you has dedicated really significant amount of time over the last few six plus months now talking to business improvement districts, different um, business owners in, in neighborhoods, policymakers, kind of industry experts, and people who have been wrestling with this subject matter for a long time. I'm wondering if you could just share a little bit about what that experience has, has meant for your company and then maybe a specific or tangible example of how that uh, maybe uh, led to you kind of developing a new feature or changing how you're taking your product to market or maybe where you see going next uh, in New York City or in other markets where you're active. Um, Davida and Melissa, maybe I'll start with you guys this time, you ladies this yeah. time. Sure, and um, uh, Melissa, uh, you know, I'll 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 tee you up, but you know, I think uh, our experience just show, shows every single community is is unique, um, and uh, and you know, one of the benefits of our platform is that we can measure everywhere. Um, we've been you know mapping throughout this um, the three month period, and now really diving into the analysis and just understanding how the data can support all the many initiatives. Um, not just, you know, at the city, I think, you know, maybe, uh, you know, over 10 different agencies are working on, on uh, issues related to emissions reductions, to public health, to equity, COVID-19, and the nexus with air quality has really um, heightened that significance. So, you know, uh, been very powerful to learn about how the data can support, and we're really going to be investing now um, in, in that analysis to, to ensure that, that we are providing those, um, those results. So that's been incredibly um, powerful. And I think, you know, one of the other things that, you know, I'll just, I'll just speak to again, and one, one, although every community is unique, um, the one tragic commonality is that pollution burdens are unequally distributed. So everywhere we measure, you see those block by block differences up to 800% difference from one block to the next. Um, and so it matters where you live. And so really, you know, um, uh, talking to the people that live and breathe, uh, this experience every day um, is also a really powerful and important part of ensuring that the that the data um, ultimately supports local needs. Yeah, yeah, that eight hundred percent differential was was very stark. I remember it, you know the first time you shared that kind of early insight with our team. It was it was quite something to think about. You know, within a borough, within even a neighborhood, that idea is is really powerful, and I think provides us a very tangible data-driven way to talk about equity and talk about kind of all the different things that the, the city has the opportunity to look at to improve outcomes for everyone. Yeah. Melissa, anything to add to that? Sorry about that. Uh, you know, I mean, just to build on what Davida said, um, it's, it's really helpful for us to make connections with people in like city businesses and, and, you know, local, local community groups to find out how like, this you know this one data set can help really inform so many different uh, types of of you know possible projects, possible ways forward to sort of solve you know a, a number of different things. And they all together they all add up towards us moving towards you know uh, uh, a healthier environment, and also the the really kind of tackled 
climate emissions as well as you know emissions that really impact health at the same time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Great. Bobby, I know you got you know, no shortage of uh, feedback from the Laundry BK, from Kenneth and his team at Flatbush Junction Bid. You're, you're kind of testing your product in a few different locations with kind of a few different customer bases, and there's a lot of learnings there. What has that been like for you? Yeah, um, so I think it's just to take like a quick step back, like the, the company obviously originated in Chile, but the idea is still like brand new here. But, um, so it, the the team that led the investment closed with partners in El Grama wanted to bring it to the States. And so this idea of just reusing your bottles, obviously clearly new to consumers, but the company as a whole offering a solution is still very new. And so even us going to market now, it's we're still in the early stages and kind of learning um, you know, not only for consumers in terms of how much they really like the idea and, and the savings point um, from the other side of the aisle in terms of working with like Kenneth and so forth has been has been great, right? So we we know that we we're aligning with a lot of these different governments and different municipalities goals and objectives and moving forward. Um, the opportunity uh, for them to potentially open doors for different locations for us to get into, like Kenneth was um, from Flatbush uh, District was instrumental uh, for us in terms of getting into the laundromat and bedside, which is which is terrific, and also trying to connect us with. Um, some local restaurants and potentially drive the tricycle down there and provide um, uh, hand sanitizer and disinfectant spray and so forth. Um, so I think in general, you know, just the program as a whole has been great. Um, I think, you know, governments, uh, no knock on governments or the city, they tend to move a bit slower <laughs> as much as they, they want to uh, support you, which is great. Eventually we'll get there. Um, but I think, you know, from the get go, it's, it's been invaluable with the feedback we received. Um, and then just to add an additional point, we've we've worked with Green City Force, um, which is a nonprofit or organization um, that provides lower income, um, uh, I would say kind of like young uh, college students-ish, um, the opportunity to work within a sustainability industry and train them. Um, so we've been fortunate to bring on two, two alumni of Green City Force to be basically brand ambassadors with the machine, stand with the machine, interact with consumers, educate them about uh, reusing their bottles. Great. I love to see that, you know, market entry as a means to also start getting more boots on the ground and, and it, um, integrated with the local community. That, that's great to see. Uh, David, any, any specific learnings you want to pull out from some of the conversations I know Building Energy Exchange, Con Ed, NYSERDA, all were, were kind of um, keen contributors to, to watching what Sapient was up to with Circular City? Yeah, I, I mentioned, you know, education before. I think uh, what is consistent across all of the discussions we have with you know, Fortune 50 companies down to you know, nonprofit organizations is no one is managing plug load. It's shocking. And you know, I always say, can you imagine being the, the, the head of energy for a corporation that has a large footprint of real estate and you have to go to your boss who says, how are we coming along with managing our energy? And you can say, we're doing really well, but there's one third to possibly 50% of it that we're not touching because there hasn't been a solution out there. I think during our discussions, um, education was a key point that you guys shared, and it was a really insightful one because, you know, going in and doing it has impact with occupancy and, uh, you know, turning things off at different times and making sure people know what's going on and how, how to deal with that is important. We think we have a pretty low touch approach for that, but we've, um, you know, one thing that came directly from our discussions that I showed briefly during that, during the presentation was a um, company employee facing dashboard in which We've, we're now seeing the opportunities for some organizations doing a gamification on carbon reduction, where we can easily segment both, you know, accounting departments from sales departments, from operations departments, actually to see who can actually generate, you know, lower reductions for this month or next month. Mm -hmm. And, um, and it, it seems to be resonating really nicely. As soon as you go, go green, you're not talking about reducing costs um, with employees. It resonates completely differently. And then when we go in and do installation, we've kind of, added on email communications that the corporation can do with their, with their employees before we get there. And when we are there, when we go to someone's workstation, you know, we're taking out their, their dump strip, if you will, and plug it in a smart strip. We leave a love note there telling them this is what we did. Again, you've already heard that we we're gonna do it. Now we have done it. And then lastly, to make sure that they're engaged in it, we even just, and, and some of it came from our discussions here with New Lab and Circular City, that um, how, how can you give more control to the actual employees? because the, the applications run by facilities people typically. 
and we've uh, we've created a um, an automated um, employee uh, you know employee centric scheduler that if they want to go in and schedule their own time and they're really into it they can go Monday through you know Sunday if they're going to go on vacation they can put in this and it ties right in line to our application how it's integrated in for an individual employee out of so there's 1,700 in the building or 3,000 in the building for one company. They can go in there and schedule their only time of when to turn off their stuff, when they're not gonna be there um, and overrule what the organization typically wants to do in a general approach. Wow. So those things are really helpful. Great. Well, I think I'm gonna pass it back to my colleague, Kate, to close this out, but I just wanna say thank you to, to each of you and, and your broader teams for spending so much of 2020 with us. And I think it's just tremendous that we were able to launch these pilots in New York City amidst you know, really an unprecedented year and to see the positive community feedback and to see the traction that each of you are building kind of what the year ahead holds. Uh, certainly New Lab is excited to continue supporting you from the background and, and making introductions and, and seeing you succeed. So congratulations and thanks again for joining us. And, Kate, I'll leave it to you to close this out. Yeah, thank you so much, Shana. Um, just echoing uh, what Shana said, it's been an absolute pleasure to work with each of you and your teams over the course of this year. Um, it was really exciting, and I know it's it's been a, a challenging year in a lot of ways for a lot of people. So thank you all for kind of hanging in there with us and making this program a success. Um, it was really rewarding to see these pilots deployed, uh, and I'm so excited that we had this platform today for you to be able to share it out with everybody. Um, and so thank you to everybody who joined us. Um, we really appreciate you having uh, spent the afternoon, and uh, we will be following up with a, a recording of the event so you can certainly uh, look back or share it around with anyone else who might be interested. Um, so with that, I'll, I'll close us out, but a big thank you again to, to everyone involved. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you so thank much. You. Thank Bye. you.